Well, the, even, the lecture this evening is about the World Candidates Tournament. Uh, I believe today uh, they had the opening ceremony in Kanti Mansinsk, uh, Siberia, Russia. And the uh, players, it's going to be an eight player double round robin. The winner of this tournament is going to be the challenger to world champion Magnus Carlsen. So the eight best players in the world are going to compete against one another, uh, both having black and white against one another. So it's a 14 round tournament, 14 games of top, top level chess. And we know that in the tournament is Levon Aronian, the world's number two ranked player, Vladimir Kramnik, the world's number three ranked player. Veselin Topalov, the world's number four ranked player, and so forth and so on it goes. Hopefully everybody knows about the tournament, please. Yes. Uh, good, 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 good. I have uh, three favorites in the tournament. I see Levon Aronian, Vladimir Kramnik, Veselin Topalov, who happen <laughs> to be the highest rated players in the field as being the, f the favorites. That doesn't mean that a dark horse a Peter Svidler, a Shakir Mamadarov, a uh, Andreikin, uh, Andre Andreikin uh, will not win it. It just means that they're not uh, my pre-tournament favorites. In the previous uh, candidates tournament, it came down to a two-person two race between Vladimir Kramnik and Magnus Carlsen. Going into the last round, these two players, Magnus Carlsen and Vladimir Kramnik, had the same number of points. Vladimir Kramnik was going to play black against his Ukrainian rival, Vasily Ivonshuk. Magnus Carlsen had white against Peter Svidler. Vladimir Kramnik was in in distress because essentially having black against uh, a genius like Ivanchuk was no fun to begin with. And secondly, um, Kramnik, if he drew that game, could expect that Magnus would either win with white or draw with white. Okay. So Kramnik was in a strange situation. If he plays solidly, against Vasily Ivanchuk and makes a draw. And if Magnus Carlsen plays solidly against Peter Svidler and makes a draw, then they, again, they would be tied. <clears throat> but the rules of the tiebreaker said that in case of a tie, in this particular case, because of the complicated tiebreaking procedures, Magnus Carlsen would qualify and play against Viswanathan Anand for the World Chess Championship match. Okay, so Vladimir Kramnik had to go all out for the win with black. Long story short, he ended up losing the game. Magnus Carlsen, um, uh, with white, he ended up losing this game that we're about to see. So the two players who were leading the tournament going into the last round both lost their games. Magnus Carlsen and Vladimir Kramnik ended up with an equal number of points. Magnus Carlsen had the higher tiebreaker. Magnus Carlsen went on to play against Anand and won the World Championship match, and hence today Magnus Carlsen is the world champion. So was it nerves? What happened that Magnus literally bl backed his way into the challenger. And will we see uh, this type of fighting chess and crazy results going on in Kanti Mansins this year? It will be an exciting event. In any way, uh, going down memory lane uh, for a moment, this tournament is literally a year old. It was played in March of 2013, the candidates tournament. Now, against E4, Peter Svidler has a pretty narrow repertoire, and he's long defended uh, the black side of the Spanish. So 
if Magnus was going to play e4, he could expect that he was going to get a Rui Lopez uh, defense on the board. So let's see how the game uh, in castles and the players pretty much got a standard position. Now here once again you can't go immediately for this trade of knight and bishop because this pawn lacks protection. So uh, essentially Svidler did do what you wanted to do only he didn't go hunting down the bishop on b3. d6, a3. So now as Michael so nicely pointed out uh, with this pawn protected, uh, White was concerned that knight a5 would end up capturing his bishop. So with this move a3, what Magnus wanted to do was give himself an opportunity to retreat his bishop to a2. Yes. Yes. The other, uh, I would, I would, uh, I would certainly. Uh, suggests that this move, c2, c3, is far more common than a3. So the idea of c3 is that after the knight chases the bishop, the bishop might come back to c2. Magnus's reasoning is that, okay, the bishop is okay on c2, but maybe it would even be better uh, on this diagonal. In the argument in favor of the move c3 is that it supports white's eventual uh, occupation of the center with d4. So let's see, castles, knight c3, uh, very logical move. What White is thinking is that this square on d5 makes a nice uh, launching pad, a nice uh, outpost, and this knight could also, if it wants, swing over to g3 and to f5. Okay, bishop b7, Black decides that even though he recon Black recognizes that this bishop on b3 is on a very di good diagonal, Black reckons that he's not interested in the move bishop d5, in, uh, bishop e6, pardon me, trying to trade bishops, but instead goes for his own idea of bishop b7. So let's see how the game went. Bishop d2, a rather quiet move. Black, oh, pardon me, white is just uh, uh, getting, uh, get, getting his pieces out. Queen d7, a4. And now a change of tactic, uh, strategically a change of plans by white. I had expected that white might go for knight e2 followed by knight g3 with the idea of bringing his knight to f5, and I had not expected Magnus to play the move a4. But what Magnus's reasoning is, is that, hey, listen, if you let me, I'm going to take that pawn, trade rooks, and take this pawn with my knight. If you advance your pawn to b4, then I'm going to jump to d5, and thanks to my bishop on d2, I'm going to put pressure on your advanced b pawn. Peter said, okay, I understand. If my pawn goes to b4, it'll be weak. I'll drop my knight back. I'll protect my pawn with the queen. And I'm hoping that I, as black, will be able to play knight to e6 and jump to f4 one day. a, b, a, b, rook a8, bishop a8. So a trade of rooks. And neither side has really benefited from that trade of rooks. Just it's an equal ex swap. Knight e2, well here goes Magnus trying to reposition his knight. Knight e6, knight g3. So we can kind of sum up the opening somewhat in the sense that I think both players can be satisfied uh, from, a re from a practical point of view. Um, Black has no real targets in his position, no real weaknesses. This knight can play knight c5 or perhaps one day knight d4 to try to harass the bishop. Or the knight could go to f4. From white's point of view, this knight could potentially go to f5 and try to capture a bishop. So basically a very balanced position. c5.
Now this introduces a, a different dynamic. What black is trying to say with this move is, you see my bishop on b? It's kind of hitting on granite at the moment. This pawn is very uh, well supported. But if black could play the move c5, c4, then after captures, this pawn will be vulnerable and this bishop will be on a, an excellent diagonal. So with the move c5, c4, uh, pardon me, with the move c5, black is angling for c4. Knight f5, stepping up, uh, going after the bishop on e7, bishop steps back to d8. And again, different attacking themes are now uh, coming into focus. This bishop is no great shakes on the d8 square, that's for sure, but black is thinking, look, I want to play c4, and I want to put my bishop on this diagonal against black, white's king, and hey, who's attacking whom and why? Who stands uh, worse? Um, I don't think there is anything wrong with the move that Peter Svidler played, bishop d8. I had just expected him, having said A, to continue by saying B. Uh, what Peter, why Peter may not have played this move, I'm not sure, is he may have felt that, for example, something like takes, ta oops, sorry, I did that wrong, that was a mouse slip, don't, uh, takes, no, that's not what I want, takes, 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 overwrite, where is there, overwrite, yeah, takes, 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 takes. He may have felt that in this position, white had some edge, uh, thanks to his two bishops, let's say a move like bishop b5, he may have been concerned about. But I really don't see this as much of a problem. In the first place, d6 is really defended very, very well. And in the second place, thanks to this uh, open diagonal uh, for the bishop, uh, ideas like queen b7 start to be very attractive for, for black. Let me just show you one uh, idea. Um, the knight is threatening to play to, D, to g2 when there is a massive attack on this diagonal. But that was not Peter's choice, and what he did was certainly okay. I just expected him to continue with his idea of c5, c4. He played bishop d8. Magnus stopped black from playing c4. Takes, takes. Now, as a result of this exchange, uh, the pawn structure has changed, and this pawn is a little bit weak. This pawn is okay. This pawn a uh, little bit backward, but what was really happened is that this bishop is actually now very passive. Even if it were to move to the square d6, it would not be on an active diagonal. So I think that overall this trade of what's happened on the queen side has benefited white. Bishop c7, rook e1, rook e8, queen c1. This is an interesting little move by Magnus, this move queen c1. What Magnus is saying with this move is what he wants to do is play his knight to g5 or even potentially his bishop to h6. If the bishop is captured, the queen could recapture and there would be a sudden attack on black's king. So I thought this little, little nuanced shift by uh, Magnus was, was uh, a little cheeky, I, I might say, and uh, quite effective. Sometimes the simplest moves are best. Knight h5. So what was the idea here? With this move, Peter, Peter is saying, well, bishop h6, I can deal with that by just advancing my pawn. I don't even have to capture the bishop. But it's also ambitious. Black is saying, hey, there's no reason why I shouldn't put my knight on an excellent square, f4. g3, I agree with you. I don't want you to put your knight on h4. 
g6. I don't like your knight on f5 either. Check, king g7. And now things are really starting to heat up. And it's not 100% clear to anyone, and I remember being literally glued to my monitor watching these ga the, the, this game unfold because it was so critical to the world championship title. Uh, suddenly there's a lot of ideas, uh, <coughs> thanks to this pawn coming to g3, Black has a lot of ambitions of sliding his queen over to the h3 g4 square. Ideas like knight takes f7, queen takes f7, knight g5, combinations like, the, like that are in the air. And um, I wasn't sure, was the knight well placed on h6 or off sides? Knight comes to g5. Okay, with this knight jumped to the g5 square, the pawn on f7 is attacked twice, and black has to do something about that. He traded knights and played the move d6, d5. Sorry, before black played the move d6, d5, obviously the bishop on c4 and the knight on h6 are both attacking this pawn. Uh, Peter had the possibility of playing f7, f6, attacking the bishop, perhaps forcing the bishop to return, and then playing d5. But Peter liked his pawns around his king, where they are, and he played the move d5. And this is sort of what, what we kind of call Henri, H-O-N-E-R-Y, Henri resistance. I mean, with this move, what Peter's trying to do is open up this diagonal, and after all, white's king is also um, exposed. Pawn takes, bishop takes, knight g4. So this is a, a tricky move. Uh, at first sight, it appears that queen takes, you put your knight under attack, but then the bishop takes, recaptures on d5. If you play bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, protects the knight, and also, this bishop is trying to angle to try to get at black's king. Maybe bishop h6, check. Or, do you see this, this cute tactic? Uh, let's, let's make a, a terrible move for black for a second. Uh, what's a bad move? This is a bad move. Good. <laughs> I knew I could find one. Uh, bishop f6, check. Ooh, with the idea... Knight takes, queen check, ooh, and then, ouch, knight takes f6, and there's the checkmate on h7, the knight attacks the queen, and black is lost. So, uh, definitely black has to be very, very careful. So, Peter played bishop f3, attacking the knight. Magnus played bishop f6, check. King dropped back to g8. The knight is hanging. Knight h6, check. King f8. And with this wild position, crazy things are going on. Black's dream is to play queen h3 and queen g2 checkmate. White's dream is to capture all kinds of pawns in black's position, this pawn on f7, this pawn on c5, while at the same time staving off checkmate against his own king. Queen e3 attacks the bishop on f3, attacks the pawn on c5, and both players were getting into a uh, serious what we call Zeitnot, or time trouble. That is to say they had a little time on the clock in a very wild position. Bishop dropped back to b7, and bishop dropped back to h4. It's absolutely crazy. In this position, the computers were all saying, 
that white had a very big advantage by a crazy move that, frankly, many human players, most human players, would not consider. This bishop on f6 is under threat to this knight on h5. So uh, Magnus could consider capturing this pawn, sacrificing his bishop to get this rook, or he could consider moving this bishop. He decided to retreat the bishop to h4. It turns out that according to the computer, that if, <laughs> if Magnus had found the move bishop h8, he's actually doing very well. He's winning the game. Uh, it, it's a crazy, but whoever thought of putting their bishop on h8 as a way of uh, being in safety? Uh, the reality is, thanks to the knight on h6, there's no king g8, and you're not going king e7 to attack the bishop because the pawn is hanging on e5. In the meanwhile, you have to defend this pawn on f7, gotcha. as well as the pawn on c5. Michael. No, a a as it turns out, he had actually played it accurately. It was only in this position that he didn't find the move bishop h8 that would be uh, the cause of his downfall. So what he did, he actually played a really, really good game, uh, and it was at this critical juncture that he has missed bishop h8. And of course, as Peter confessed, happily confessed after the game as well, he didn't consider that move either. Yeah, but sure. Okay. Oops. I beg your pardon. So with the bishop going to h8. So okay. So essentially, black is facing two very distinct and direct threats. The first one is this pawn is hanging, and it can be captured either. If it's captured by the knight, that would open up a possibility of queen check. And the second uh, threat that white has is also to snabble this pawn on c5. So it's considered that this move, queen c6, defending the pawn on c5 while simultaneously introducing a new threat of queen g2 checkmate would have been black's best move. Now, white has to decide how he wants to deal with this threat. He can do it one of two ways. He could block with his queen, with queen e4, or he could play the move f2, f3. It was considered, uh, when the players uh, analyzed the game in hindsight, that f3 was white's best play. And here, black has to do something about this pawn on f seven, and they were reckoning that the pawn would move to f6. What would happen hereafter? Anybody's guess. It's just a crazy, uh, a weird position that anything but standard. <laughs> Let's go back, and this bishop h4, queen h3. Well, that was a that was an uninvited guest. Uh, I'm sure Magnus had anticipated this move because it does threaten checkmate after all. But he was more likely expecting that the queen was going to come to c6, not to h3. F3 blocking the threat. This is a guy who's not being denied, huh? Knight f. So now a new threat of queen g2 check appears, captures the knight, captures the bishop, knight captures f7. Now um, again, in this moment the time, uh, the time pressure on both players was really fierce, and here 
something was going wrong uh, for Magnus. Here's, here's where the game starts to go south in a hurry. And I think that this was considered a culprit for that. Okay? So, uh, first of all, it's pretty clear that we can't go queen take c5 check and go after this bishop because our rook is hanging. Okay? It's pretty clear our knight is under duress. So, I think it was knight g4 that was, this was the move that uh, I think um, people had expected, that the chess engines had all convinced us that this was the best move by white. Obviously, this pawn is the, is the center of attention, as is this pawn. White's king is dodgy, but so is black's king. And somehow Magnus thought that knight takes f7 was a very strong move, realizing, of course, that pawn takes f4 would allow queen takes e8, uh, winning in short order. This move he has missed. Bishop takes f3, and suddenly, oops, this pawn, <laughs> very, very, very important pawn in white's camp, the bishop can't be captured because of the threat of queen takes. And in the meanwhile, black is threatening queen g4 check and once again queen g2. So Magnus suddenly under a lot of pressure, queen f2. His idea is that after queen g4 check he can block uh, and save his um, king. Pawn takes e4. A moment ago, there was a pin along the e-file when the queen was here, but now that the queen is in a, in a defensive position, there was no uh, reason for black not to capture this pawn. And in fact, after that happened, boom, just like that, it's game over. Uh, Magnus is in a losing ending. One, two, three pawns. One, two, three, four pawns for black. Furthermore, Black has the two bishops, giving him an edge as well. The final moves of the game were knight g5. And now we see what's happening. It's simple. Black is just going push, 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 and queening. Uh, it was strange because in the other game between Vladimir Ivanchuk and uh, uh, Vladimir Kramnik and Vesely Ivanchuk, uh, their position had also gone into a time trouble situation. And at the end of that time trouble, Kramnik realized he was losing. And, and through most of his game, he had avoided making a draw. So then he suddenly woke up to this horrible realization that, damn, if I just made a draw, I would have been the one playing Vichy Anand for the World Championship. And this was the final. I think Magnus resigned here. Yeah, this was. So very, very exciting uh, tournament. Again, the most exciting tournament in the last decade that I can recall. Mm -hmm.